the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So as I shared this story on Thursday, Ed Jones says, you went to seminary for three years, received a degree just to be able to stand in front of us and tell us your, uh, your list of complaints. And I said, yes, exactly. Uh, so anybody who spent at least 30 minutes with me over the last two and a half weeks have, has probably heard um, that our refrigerator is broken. <laughs> our second refrigerator. We have a refrigerator, I just have to go down into the basement to get milk for my coffee. Uh, so in the whole scheme of the universe, life is okay. Life is okay. But it seems uh, that I've been fixated on this. I was camping uh, two weeks ago, and uh, my buddies who I hadn't spent time with in a while uh, were noticing that I spent way too much time on my cell phone trying to remedy this refrigerator that was six hours away. Um, and uh, as I've been on the phone, uh, when it's scheduled to be fixed in another week and a half, uh, I will be in Haiti, uh, and as I'm talking on the phone and saying I can't do that day because I'll be in Haiti, uh, all of a sudden you know, the ramifications of one of our two refrigerators being down uh, diminished quite considerably. Uh, I thought about, in the scheme of the world, this should not preoccupy anywhere near as much of my time uh, and emotional energy as it does. People have had to walk into uh, uh, cellars and uh, uh, actually salt their food. And over the course of history, this is about this important. Uh, but it's been a concern. And then it got me thinking back to uh, in March. Remember that windstorm that came through in March that uh, messed with all of our internet and cable? Uh, I remember how colossal it was uh, that our internet was down for several days at a time and our cable was down and, and then it would come up intermittently and then it would fall back down and uh, it really caused me significant trauma. I, I, I'm speaking a little lightly about this, but in, a, uh, in the whole scheme of things. Uh, and then um, in between March and now I had uh, the worst thing that could possibly happen. Uh, my cell phone went down for a couple days. Uh, <laughs> and you want to talk about real trauma right there. Uh, but I have to tell you, these things caused me more alarm uh, than whether or not I went a few days uh, without really communicating with God. Whether I went uh, and skipped a few church services uh, or was feeling uh, a little bit low in my tank as far as my connection uh, with my maker, creator, and sustainer. Uh, and I invite you to ask the same question. Does the balance in your bank account or these things going wrong in your life cause you more anxiety and angst than the thought that, you know, I just don't feel very connected to God. I haven't been able to make it to church. My prayer life is thin. And as you ask yourself these questions, listen to the first part of the three different parts of the story I want to share. The first part. A man comes up to Jesus, uh, kneels before Jesus, and says, uh, uh, and, and calls him good, uh, and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus uh, suggests the commandments first is a good place to start. He says, I know those. I've been following those since uh, my youth, which is good for him. Um, and then he says, uh, and he looks at him. That's the important thing. Remember that. He looks at him. He looks at him, and he loves him. This is a particular. This is a person known to God, beloved by God, that God knows what separates him from the fullest person God made him to, to be. God knows what separates them in their relationship together, like a wife knows what's separating uh, her from her relationship with her husband. He looks at him, loves him, and says, it's your stuff. <laughs> It's your dependence on your stuff. It's all your possessions. It's all your wealth. And not just the effect that that wealth has on your own life, uh, but the effect that it has on the lives of others. You're hoarding your, uh, your wealth. You're using your wealth. Your dependency on your wealth and your lack of generosity with your wealth and the way that you look at other people who have less wealth, all of those different ways separate you from your fullest self, separate you from using all the gifts that God has given. You, who I love, who I love enough to love you right in the place that you are, but love you enough not to let you stay there. You need to unbind yourself from the thing that holds you down. 
your need for these things. So do you let go of them? And it's when the only people in Scripture uh, that comes seeking to follow Jesus and doesn't. Can't let go. So the first question for each one of us, when Jesus who looks at us, who looks deep within us, who loves us, comes to us, what question would he ask? What are we holding on to so tightly it keeps us from our fullest self? It stands between us and that full relationship with God that God so desperately seeks. What would he challenge us to let go of? Number one. Number two. I don't think this passage is entirely about dropping all of your material resources. But I do think it's squarely about money. And we cannot let ourselves off the hook. We must examine our relationship with money, our acquisition of stuff, the amount of resources it takes for us to live the life that we live, uh, and the fact that we know that our brothers and sisters made in the exact same image of God can't realize the same life that we had and, and, and it, for it to be sustainable that our wealth comes at the expense of others, and that our wealth and our seeking of the security around that wealth has an effect on us. Jesus tells the uh, parable of a camel uh, trying to fit through the eye of a needle. And he says, it is more difficult for a wealthy person, for a rich person, uh, to go into heaven as it is, uh, it's more difficult for a camel uh, to slide through the eye of a needle than for a rich person uh, to get into the kingdom of heaven. And they were astonished. I think Jesus wants us to examine our relationship with money and the hold it has on us. And people have tried to talk themselves out of this passage for years. Uh, they, uh, 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 it's been somewhat uh, debunked, but uh, there is this idea that the entry into the city uh, was called the, uh, the camel's eye. Uh, and uh, in order to, uh, uh, to keep uh, people who aren't necessarily friendly to the city from coming in, uh, they would have to stop take their side uh, bags off of their camel in order for the camel to slide in. Uh, and so the, basically the metaphor is uh, to take all the baggages you're carrying and let go of them so that you can get into heaven. Uh, I think that's letting us off the hook a little bit. I think Jesus meant what he said. Um, and that's number two. Our relationship with money is concerning to God, and we need to examine it in our own lives. Number three, listen closely to what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't say there's no wealthy people in heaven. He doesn't say wealthy people cannot ever end up in heaven. He says they can't, active voice, get into heaven. Do you know how many people are in heaven because they got themselves into heaven? Zero. And they were astonished. In fact, they were so astonished they said to themselves, well, if they can't get into heaven, who can? And we're not quite as astonished because uh, we've lived for a couple thousand years uh, in a different world than they have. But at that point, you know who got whatever they wanted? The haves. The haves could wield so much influence because of what they had uh, that they could bend the world to their way of being, to their way of wanting. What they wanted in the world, they got. And especially if you were not one of the rich, that's the way you saw it. If they, who can wield everything to their way of being, cannot get into heaven, then who can? This isn't worth trying. What Jesus is also saying is that heaven is not to be earned. And the more that we understand the things of this world that give us power and might and influence and authority, the less we understand fully what really matters to God and what gets us into God's uh, loving embrace. It is grace. It is nothing earned or deserved or manipulated or shifted. The more we hold on to those things that we think wield power, the less we can really see what really holds power in the world. The less we can see what really matters. So one, one. God looks you in the eye, loves you, and wants you to confront what's separating you from fully realizing your gifts 
and the grace that's already in your lives. Two. Each of us, and especially us in the richest nation in the world, in one of the richest counties in America, need to examine our relationship with money. And how much do we value ourselves because of it? How much does it control? And what power does it wield in our lives? And three, the more we let go of the things that this world tells us gives us value and power and persuasion, the more that we can open ourselves up to the real truth which is that we are loved by grace, we are saved by grace, and the kingdom of God is not earned. It is given out of love. Hold on to those three, examine them, and I think we get at the heart of the passage. It is a God who loves us, who meets us where we are, and who urges us to come and follow. Amen.